One of the most controversial decisions in Super Bowl history took place in the closing seconds of Super Bowl 49 in 2015. The Seattle Seahawks, with 26 seconds remaining and trailing by four points, had the ball on second down in the New England Patriots' one-yard line. Everybody expected Seahawks coach Pete Carroll to call for a handoff to running back Marshawn Lynch. Why wouldn't you expect a call? It was a short yardage situation, and Lynch was one of the best running backs in the NFL. Instead, Carroll called for quarterback Russell Wilson to pass. New England intercepted the ball, winning the Super Bowl moments later. The headlines the next day were brutal, and there were a bunch of headlines. I'm not going to read them all here, um, but continue on from the book here. Although the matter was considered by nearly every pundit as beyond debate, a few outlying voices argued that the play choice was sound, if not brilliant. Benjamin Morris's analysis on 538.com and Brian Burks on Slate.com convincingly argued that the decision to throw the ball was totally defensible, invoking clock management and end-of-game considerations. They also pointed out that an interception was an extremely unlikely outcome. Out of 66 passes attempted from an opponent's one-yard line during the season, zero had been intercepted. In the previous 15 seasons, the interception rate in that situation was about 2%. Those dissenting voices didn't make a dent in the avalanche of criticism directed at Pete Carroll. Whether or not you buy into the contrarian analysis, most people didn't want to give Carroll the credit for having thought through it or having any reason at all for his call. That raises the question, why did so many people strongly believe that Pete Carroll got it wrong? We can sum it up in four words. The play didn't work. So that was from Annie Duke's book, Thinking in Bets, and joining me to discuss today is Tony Dye. So Tony, welcome to the show. Tell the folks a bit about yourself. Well, thank you, Mickey. Um, really short, I'm an old IT guy who is retired, which means I sit around and do absolutely nothing but read books, <laughs> except for all the other things I do from time to time, which is just yeah. all over the place. But this book caught my attention. I think you had read it before I read it, and you had made some comment to it. And I grabbed it and I did it as an audible book and I listened to it all the way through and I immediately listened to it all the way through again. And then I got the physical book and I listened to it all the way through. I think I'm on like my sixth time going through this book. I've never done that with a book before. That's how Hmm. impressive this book was to me. Gotcha. So why don't you summarize it for folks that haven't read the book? Certainly the Seahawks analogy was part of it, but decisions and outcomes being different, but give, give me your, your, three sentence overview of what you thought here. I don't know that I've got three sentences. I may vary off a little bit here because I spent the first couple of minutes thinking, what kind of book is this? You know, is it about decision-making, alternative views, communications, relationships, something else, everything else? It's got time travel (laughs) in it. It's mentoring in it. It's accountability in it. It has got so darn many different things in this book that it's hard to put one name on it. Yeah, fair enough. But I'm going to go in a direction, something okay. that she caught me, and I'm going to stray off for just a second here. Epistemology is one of my favorite words, <laughs> All right. but only recently, because I've always looked at that and said, that's one of those darn theological words, and I hate theological words. We need to fix the world and not use those and explain what we really mean. Okay. Then I was reading a book a while back, And it used epistemology, and it wasn't a spiritual book at all. It was about communication. It explained epistemology. I said, wow, that's philosophy, not anything else. And so I'm going to give my definition, or it's not even a definition of epistemology, is what do you believe on a topic? Why do you believe it? And how strongly do you believe it? And the how strongly fits what Annie likes to say. One of her common things in this book is, want to bet. Mm -hmm. Are are you willing to bet that this is true? And I just love that concept. So I've taken epistemology, which has been a favorite word, and then I read another book recently that brought in the word teachability, which is not a new word, but I kind of like that one. I can identify with it. But Annie goes into truth-seeking, and I like that better than the other two. I want to okay. be a truth seeker. Yep. Yeah. This is just audio, but I see over your shoulder on the wall, it says value truth above all else, <laughs> which I love that. That's when I think of truth, though, I do think of you because you look at things from every angle. And we'll get into some of that in a bit, too. But I try. that's a great way to put it. So, yeah, for those that haven't read it, yeah, the book is Thinking in Bets. And that's Annie's push in this is to think of things as bets, as odds to succeed or fail and not necessarily be worried about the outcome. Um, I, I saw a good summary of the book somewhere that said, you might not be a gambler, but that's no reason to not think in bets. 
Whether or not there's money involved, bets make us take a harder look at how much certainty there is in the things we believe, consider alternatives, and stay open to changing our minds for the sake of accuracy. So let go of right and wrong when it's decision time. Accept that things are always somewhat uncertain and make the best bet you can. And I thought that was a great summary of the book, just to, to look at it that way. And we'll talk about some of those sorts of things. One, one I really liked um, is how things are just never 100%. You know, I've, I've seen uh-huh. people that say, you know, this is a 100% chance, this is a 0% chance, and I don't, I don't believe that in life. I think, I mean, I fully plan on publishing this podcast, and if someone's listening to it, it worked out, but it's not 100%. I mean, things can go sideways and things happen. So a couple quotes that she said from there I thought were great. She said, one, she said, quote, forcing ourselves to express how sure we are of our beliefs brings to plain sight the probabilistic nature of those beliefs, that what we believe is almost never 100% or 0% accurate, but rather somewhere in between. And then she also said, Quote, there are many reasons why wrapping our arms around uncertainty and giving a big hug will help, up, help us become better decision makers. Here are two of them. First, I'm not sure is simply a more accurate representation of the world. Second, and related, when we accept that we can't be sure, we are less likely to fall in the trap of black and white thinking. So I thought that was fantastic digging into those. She follows on a theme that you've been on for at least a few months, maybe a few years, and that's... Um, who was it said Adam Grant, the joy of being wrong? I think that was him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And when you're wrong, that means you're less wrong than you used to be. You exactly. quoted that a yep. number of times. Uh, I have. Yeah. She's all about that. She's mm-hmm. on this theme. So I'm, I'm really good with what she's saying. <laughs> yeah. The less wrong is great. It was, um, I'm pulling it up now here. Just, I, I can't remember who said it, but yeah, it was from Adam Grant's book. So yeah, okay. I do enjoy having been wrong because it means I'm now less wrong than I was before. So yeah, you said it about perfectly there. But yeah, well, that's just so we're talking quoting about... you. Hey, there you go. I'm quoting Adam Grant. And he's probably pulling it somewhere else. So yeah, my favorite thing about this book though is yeah, thinking in terms of of good decisions versus good outcomes and how they're not necessarily related. I heard her on a podcast once talking about if you you know she's a poker player. That's how she started all this. She was a professional poker player. Now has become more of an author, but most of her stuff ties back to gambling and poker. But she gave the example of if you start a hand of poker and you have two aces in your initial hand and you end up losing the hand, what lesson do you take away from it? Do you fold next time you get two aces to start a hand? Like that'd be ridiculous that you had a a good decision and a bad outcome and it happens. But if you start with two aces next time, you're probably going to win. But if you tie those together, say, nope, I, I made a bad decision to stick with two aces. Like that's a horrible bit of reasoning there. Yeah. Um, she talks about this a bunch, kind of like the Seahawks example we started with, where that was a good decision. It just had a poor outcome at a very big stage. But she says a couple things that really tie into that. She says, quote, what makes a decision great is not that it has a great outcome. A great decision is the result of a good process, and that process must include an attempt to accurately represent our own state of knowledge. That state of knowledge, in turn, is some variation of, I'm not sure. And then she also said, over time... These world-class poker players taught me to understand what a bet really is, a decision about an uncertain future. The implications of treating decisions as bets made it possible for me to find learning opportunities in uncertain environments. Treating decisions as bets, I discovered, helped me avoid common decision traps, learn from the results in a more rational way, and keep emotions out of the process as much as possible. And I think you you, you talked about truth. I think truth and emotions can a lot of times contradict each other or at least have conflict like you know you're emotionally invested in something and so you don't want to see that it's not true but it, it's a tough thing it's very hard to remove emotions i think it's a great idea to remove emotions from all decisions and i'll let you know when i've done that <laughs> exactly yeah much easier said than done yeah. i mean yeah that's, that's something i struggle with too is in terms of you know selling marketing services like our company i want to be very rational and clear about things but i know that emotions are a big part of it i struggle to I don't want to say manipulate, certainly wouldn't do that, but just even to tap emotions of people. I don't want to do that because it feels wrong, but that's, that's how people make decisions. You know, people make decisions and I, I know I've done this with purchasing things. I'll buy something emotionally and then try to find the facts later to uh-huh. support why I needed that new car, that video game or whatever Absolutely. it was like, yeah, we all do that quite a bit. And the Stoics yeah, have been trying to, be. to teach us this for thousands of years and I agree with them and someday I'll get mm-hmm. there. Maybe. <laughs> There you go. Um, another thing she talked about I thought was interesting was temporal discounting, where 
letting the future person handle it, you know, which, which is a tough thing. She talked about Jerry Seinfeld's whole spiel with night guy versus morning guy where the Jerry can stay up late at night. Cause it's the other Jerry that has to wake up early in the morning. And I've talked about that too, with like the flashcards I study, like I throw flashcards into my system all the time for things to remember. Cause I don't have to go through the flashcards. That's the other Mickey that's going to deal with oh, that wow. tomorrow. Like I just want to learn that thing. So I'm going to throw it in there. I thought it was fascinating to think about that sort of thing with, yeah, what, what the future looks like. I heard a thing, I don't think it was in this book, about your calendar. You know, it's so easy to say, can you meet for lunch tomorrow? You're like, oh, I'm too busy. But how about in a month? Oh, sure, I'm wide open in a month. But you shouldn't accept that. If you wouldn't do it tomorrow, like, I'm bad about that. It's something I don't want to do. I'll accept it because it's far enough in the future. It's not not me, but it is me. And the temporal discounting is a big, big struggle I have, and I think most people have. I loved her whole concept of time travel. The future me and the past me and the current me. And I want all three of those to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. That was just a neat idea that what I do today will affect the future. What I did in the past affects me today in future. And I need to look at that. Yep. Yeah, it, was, it was a fascinating thing. I think usually it's, it's troublesome, you know, like the calendar thing. It's usually taking on burdens you don't want to take on, but because it's so far out, it's the other guy handling it. I think that's where I think it's kind of neat the way I handle it with flashcards, though, because it's tricking me into learning more because the, the future me will have to do the learning. So it's kind of a good thing if you can play it the right way, but I, I certainly handle the, the bad side of it quite often, sure. too. So it's, Absolutely. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, have you looked yeah. at her, uh, she's part of it, her Alliance for Decision Education? I have not, no. I love this, uh, you know, alliancefordecisioneducation.org. But you go to the first page on it, and it's just this gorgeous, simple page. Every day, our children make thousands of decisions on their own. Statistics, 70% of young people mistake ads for news. 96% wow. of children see web content as fact. Those are big numbers. Now, wow. here's my thing, and this reinforces something Annie said. We tend to believe what we hear and later maybe go check it. I have not fact-checked mm -hmm. this website because it's <laughs> Annie's site, and I know that she's a fact-checker. I immediately believe it, and I ought to check fact-check it, but I haven't. Right. And also, the other thing she says, and many other books reinforce is once you believe something, you'll keep finding evidence to support what you believe. Therefore, these are absolutely, in her terms, 100% true facts that I just <laughs> gave you. Has to be true. So I'll defend yeah, them that's... now. If you disagree with me, you're wrong and I'm right. Right, because you'll find other websites that happen to agree, even if it's only 2% uh -huh. that agree. I mean, we see a lot of things. That's a, that's a, a great point. That's I mean, not, I agree completely. And... You know, this is a neat thing that she's doing, that she's working within the school system, trying to say, let's make better decisions. Mm -hmm. How neat is that? Yeah, that's that's pretty awesome. I think maybe that's where we are in the world, too, because I think growing up when we had encyclopedias, I think those were, were more trustworthy. You go look something up, that's where you looked it up, and I guess maybe we should, could have fact-checked that, but I don't know how you would fact-check against an encyclopedia in 1980 either. So Not things were more true. But, and check out a dozen books and I just right, research that, all that. That would be hard. Yeah. Yeah, so now you have better ways to fact check, but more need to fact check as well. And a lot of people are still stuck in the, I saw it, so it must be true. And it, it fits my narrative, so it really must be true. So that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. She does a great job of, of fighting against that and something I try to fight against a lot. Um, that brings a, a good point here. So, like, you gave me the book called The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. And I'm like, no, I don't agree with this. I don't like it. it went against, but I read it, and it opened my eyes. Like, it was, it's forcing my, you know, forcing people to look at, things from a different perspective in the case, the book actually made a great case for fossil fuels. And it was a fantastic read to understand where they were coming from, even though it didn't, didn't fit my natural belief there. So that's I think part of what we do is force ourselves to see other things. Uh, the quote from the book that reminded me of that, uh, she said in the book, she said, quote, we might think of ourselves as open-minded and capable of updating our beliefs based on new information, but the research conclusively shows otherwise. Instead of altering our beliefs to fit new information, we do the opposite altering our interpretation of that information to fit our beliefs. So exactly what you said a minute ago. I mean, again, you've read the book six times, so you're probably quoting from memory <laughs> for some of her stuff. But yeah, that's something I try hard to do because I do the same thing. Like, I want to believe this thing, so I'm going to find research to back it up and ignore the stuff that's against it because they're silly people. They don't know what they're talking about. But it's that's not a good way to go about things. To be objective is very difficult. I'm following your lead in all of this as I want to leave that room for stuff being a little bit wrong and let me investigate it. 
Am I willing mm-hmm. to change my mind on something that I'm firmly convinced of? Yep. I will tell you yes, but I don't know <laughs> yeah. that I have the evidence to back it up. I think most people would say yes, but I think the fact that you're willing to consider that perspective puts you in a small minority already, which is a good place to be. Well, think, you know, there's a lot of people that don't even think about it. You know, they just blindly accept it. So you and I, I think are two people, maybe the only two I know who are willing to be just a little bit wrong in everything we believe. And hmm. I think that's yeah. a neat place to be. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, yeah. Cause I don't think in absolutes too much. I think of things like I have a theory that I've not tested. I don't know if it's true or not, but I have a theory that everyone is a little bit agnostic, you know, yeah. the, the most diehard Christian in the world is going to have moments of doubt, but the most diehard atheist is going to see a sunset and say, well, maybe there's something else. Like I just have a hard time believing anyone is a hundred percent or zero percent on either end of that. And I see so many things through that lens. Like, okay, this person is a serious believer. They're 99%, but I'm sure they've had moments of doubt. And this person believes God does not exist, has all the evidence, but every now and then probably thinks like, huh, that really adds up differently. Mm-hmm. And I try to see things through that lens and have that lens myself. You know, again, I think people on both ends will argue, but if there's, I'm sure I could talk to a Christian that is a hundred percent sure and an atheist that is a hundred, hundred percent sure. And one of them is clearly wrong. So, you know, <laughs> just has to be. So it'd be interesting to see there. Yeah, um, absolutely. It, Talking about being wrong here, it's another quote from the book I thought about how to figure out you might be wrong. This is great. You're just leading me through my notes without seeing, which is fantastic here. Um, she said, quote, why might my belief not be true? What other evidence might be out there bearing on my belief? Are there similar areas I can look toward to gauge whether similar beliefs to mine are true? What sources of information could I have missed or minimized on the way to researching my belief? What are the reasons someone else could have a different belief? What's their support? And why might they be right instead of me? What other perspectives are there as to why things turned out the way they did? Like she asked a lot of questions that we can ask ourselves and dig into that thing again, looking like the Seahawks, you know, it's, it, there's so many different ways to look at that situation and, and wonder, you know, did we see it wrong? Did Pete Carroll see it wrong? Like who, who saw what? And there's, there's no right answer. You know, even, even the stats I put at the beginning that pass has only been intercepted 2% of the time. Well, he probably knew that there was a chance to be picked off. He just figured the odds were low enough uh-huh. and he was willing to, to roll the dice to, to make a good decision with a, likely good outcome and that's that's what sports are that's what life is is making the best decision we can and heck i, w- I always wonder with that game too if they'd handed off to marshawn lynch and he happened to fumble how many people would have come out and said well c- come on they had plenty of time they should have tried to pass first before they handed off they had plenty of time to hand it off to him later they should have passed first you know so easy to be a, a monday morning quarterback and that sort of thing but i yeah, think about how how you might be wrong is is a great thing to do and yeah i, I do a lot of that and you you certainly inspire that from me as well well, I, and uh, I've got a friend who is actually my next door neighbor who has anywhere I have a belief, he has the opposite belief. I mean, okay. just down the line, opposite, opposite, right. opposite. With the one exception, we like each other. We have All decided right. that's irrelevant. Let's go have a beer and talk about it. Nice. And he has given me a couple of books. And I look at these books and I think, Wow. Um, one of my best books on Christianity is a book that is totally against Christianity because it's hmm. absolutely right that we are a bunch of nutcases. <laughs> you go back to the Reformation, you step forward and, you know, I couldn't agree with you, so we're going to start a new religion. I couldn't agree with you, so we're going to split off again. And we've now got, you know, four gazillion <laughs> different branches. Of course we're crazy. Mm -hmm. So how do we circle that back? And that's the book he gave me. And I love that book because I have to say he's right. Darn it. He Mm -hmm. may be wrong in the big picture, but he's absolutely right in the million little pictures. Right. And all those sorts of books too, one, because it may change your perspective on things, but also can help you learn how to defend your own beliefs even stronger. So you become, you know, it'll give you ammo to learn how to to fight back and defend whatever your belief might be. But you have a friend like that as well, that him and I disagree on pretty much everything, but we get lunch once a quarter or so and talk things through. It's mostly political disagreements. And that's great. I love to hear why he believes what he believes. And we both come away a little bit, a little bit more open eyed as a result. And it's, it's fantastic. It's fun. It's, and, and I love the part of this book where she talked about what was happening in the past where Supreme Court justices would have clerks from the other party mm-hmm. to yes. intentionally say, tell me what I'm going to run up against before I run up against it. And to sometimes yep. moderate the views. Mm-hmm. That surprises me. But I yeah, like I it. thought that was fantastic. Yeah, I do. And I've talked before, like on my blog and other places, it, it frustrates me a little bit too when I can 
tell what someone thinks on other beliefs because of one belief they have. Like if someone says they voted for Trump, I bet they're you know, anti-abortion. I bet they're anti-Bud Light. I bet they're pro-gun. Like you can, and those shouldn't all necessarily right. go together. You should have unique thoughts on things. Adam Grant talks about a lot about taking each issue and saying, what do I really believe on this issue versus saying, well, if I believe this one, I'm going to vote for that guy. I have to believe this whole list of things. And you don't. You can agree with some and disagree with some. And again, make the best vote you can based on the majority of what you believe. But much easier said than done. Yes, <laughs> for sure. Sure is. Um, so yeah, so as we're wrapping up, um, I have one more quote, and then if you have anything else to add, you can, but I thought this was just a great way to, to summarize the book from her. She said, quote, incorporating uncertainty in the way we think about our beliefs comes with many benefits. By expressing our level of confidence in what we believe, we are shifting our approach to how we view the world. Acknowledging uncertainty is the first step in measuring and narrowing it. Incorporating uncertainty in the way we think about what we believe creates open-mindedness, moving us closer to a more objective stance toward information that disagrees with us. So again, just what you said, finding that the open stance, the objective, sorry, that open stance toward information that disagrees with us is exactly what we're saying. It's just yeah, being willing to look at it and see it and give it an a honest look to see if it might be something that we were wrong about or we were right. And now we have more, more proof of that. So the 99% yeah. is I'm willing to disagree with you 1%. Can we mm-hmm. move forward from there? <laughs> there you go. That'll work. Yep. That goes a long exactly. way. It does indeed. So yeah, I may need to read this again because I've read it once and I've kind of dug back through my notes again, but yeah, I need to be better about rereading books. And if there's one to reread and if you haven't read this book, this is absolutely one to get. So Thinking in Bets is a fantastic book. Uh, Tony, how can people find more about you, what you've got going on in your life? Well, I'm not sure they want to, but uh, they if might. they want they to, I very rarely, nothing like you daily, do I blog. Um, I do have a website, TonyDye.com, T-O-N-Y-D-Y-E. It's been a long time since I put anything out there. That's I know, but I, I, it's in my feed reader though, and I wait for it. it, it when stuff comes in, I see it, and so yeah, okay. I encourage you to, um, to publish more and let people tell you why you're wrong. So that's that's the whole idea I'm here. For so. that, so I need to put a note out there about anybody who knows me should be uh, checking out Stacking Knowledge. And uh, oh, by the way, I was on it. There you go. Perfect. I appreciate so your time, Tony. So great to talk to you. Always good to talk to you, Mickey. Uh-huh.